begin a few introductory remarks, I just want to thank uh, James Waller, who wrote a very beautiful book called Becoming Evil, for some of what I'm going to say. I'm going to paraphrase what he says, because I think he had some very instructive things which relate to why we're all here tonight and why this, why this exhibit is taking place and this lecture series. Over 100 million people met a violent death in the 20th century, five times as many as in the 19th century and 10 times as many as in the 18th century. More than 60 million of these 100 million people, 100 million men, women, and children who met a violent death were victims of mass killing or genocide, all of which were man-made events. Our exhibit and this lecture series were designed to enhance our understanding of the conditions under which many of us, physicians included, could be transformed into killing machines. When we understand the ordinariness of extraordinary evil, we will be less surprised by evil, less likely to be unwilling contributors to evil, and perhaps better equipped to forestall evil. Ultimately, being aware of our own capacity for evil and the dispositional and situational factors that foster it is the best safeguard we can have against future genocides and mass killings. It is the pursuit of this awareness and of what we can do to cultivate the moral sensibilities to curb extraordinary evil which drove me to create medical ethics and the Holocaust. I am therefore extremely pleased that the first distinguished speaker in the Michael DeBakey Medical Ethics Lecture Series has chosen to address the question which you see behind me, or to paraphrase it, why is it so hard to learn the ethical lessons of the Holocaust? And that our first speaker is uniquely qualified to address this question. Arthur Kaplan was born in Boston and received his undergraduate degree from Brandeis University. After earning his PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Columbia University, he held academic appointments at the University of Minnesota, the University of Pittsburgh, and Columbia University. He is currently the Emanuel and Robert Hart Professor of Bioethics, Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics, and Director of the Aircraft Carrier Sized, as he calls it, Center for Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kaplan serves on many national and international bioethics committees, consults with numerous corporations and not-for-profit organizations, sits on several boards, write, uh, writes a regular column on bioethics for msnbc.com, is a frequent guest and commentator on various media outlets, and has received many awards and honors. He is the author or editor of 25 books and more than 500 papers in referee journals of medicine, science, philosophy, bioethics, and health policy. His most recent book is entitled Smart Mice, Not So Smart People. Among his many books is this one, When Medicine Went Mad, Bioethics and the Holocaust, which was in part the inspiration for this exhibit and lecture series. Dr. Kaplan wrote in the preface of this book, during the past decade, I have had the opportunity of editing and writing many books. None was more difficult to conceive, create, and bring to press than this one, end quote. I want to publicly thank Dr. Kaplan for these encouraging words, for his inspirational book, and for the generous and practical advice that aided me tremendously in the creation of this exhibit and lecture series. Therefore, it is with the greatest of pleasure that I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Arthur Kaplan. Well, it's a great uh, honor to be here. I'm sorry my parents weren't here for that introduction. They would have uh, enjoyed that. Um, a lot of credit goes to the museum for having uh, this lecture series. I was telling uh, Mr. Heck that I hadn't seen such a distinguished uh, group of uh, speakers put together anywhere. And I've uh, been to a number of conferences and events 
on the subject of the uh, Holocaust and bioethics. But Shelley in particular really uh, stuck with this and uh, made it happen. I think his vision really uh, was behind the uh, uh, fruition tonight of having the uh, series start off. And, uh, you know, it's a tough uh, crowd to compete with if you uh, think that this talk stinks. Don't give up because there are many other uh, <laughs> useful and uh, exciting speakers to come besides uh, this one. But tonight, uh, what I'm going to do is try and uh, really get us into this subject in a very uh, direct way. And I doubt that there will be a more miserable talk uh, to have to uh, psychologically endure than this one. Because one of the things that uh, comes up in answer to this question about why is it hard to uh, get bioethics to take uh, the Holocaust seriously, or why is it hard to learn the ethical lessons of the Holocaust as a more general theme, is that to answer it, you have to do something that is uh, awkward at best and sometimes produces criticism. And that is you have to look at what the Nazis said about what they did. And I'll give you a little synopsis of how uh, my talk will unfold, uh, just so you have a little guide here. A lot of people would say that um, bioethics began with the Holocaust. And some of your speakers later in the series may say that here when they're in front of you. Uh, I don't believe that's true. Uh, I think bioethics began in the United States after the Tuskegee experiment, which took place a good three decades after the events of the Holocaust. Why it took bioethics so long to come to grips with what took place in the Holocaust becomes then a puzzle. It's not so puzzling if you think bioethics started with the Holocaust, but I, I don't think that's true. So there is an issue, and I'll say more about why I don't think it's true in a second, but presuming I'm right, and it didn't, and we really didn't get bioethics centers and programs on medical ethics and a shift toward uh, taking ethics seriously until the late 70s in the United States, even then, if we looked around and said, well, what teaching takes place about these matters in medical schools, nursing schools, schools of public health, even to undergraduates, it's not a lot. There are some schools that have some uh, parts of courses which discuss a little bit of the events of the Holocaust in health science schools. There are some undergraduate courses in the history of the period that might, and there are obviously Holocaust studies programs at schools that uh, take a look in a more intense way. But it is very easy, those of you who are students in medical school or physicians or nurses or social workers, it's very easy to come out of school and have no uh, acquaintance with any of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So even arguing that bioethics as a field uh, didn't begin until the 70s, even there bioethics hasn't paid a lot of attention to this, which is weird because one would assume again that many of the things we're going to talk about this evening would have set off bioethics discussion, reflection, ethical debate, and so on. So one question becomes, so what's so hard? Why can't even the field doesn't get going with these events. And then even when a field arises, it doesn't really look into these events. Part of the answer, I think, to that is rooted in the very difficult question, which uh, puts me at odds with some Holocaust experts and thinkers. And that is that this Holocaust, I think, is distinctive because it is so intimately tied to science and technology. Uh, there have been Holocausts since, there have been Holocausts before, but what makes this particular set of incidents in Germany stand out is that it is a uh, mass murder carried out by the most sophisticated nation of its time and the nation that was premier in biomedicine. And that makes it awfully hard to look at it and really take it seriously. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, when uh, the Flexners back at the beginning of the 20th century were assigned the job of figuring out how to move American medicine from the kind of nutty quackery uh, that it was to a scientifically based and very high priced uh, entity that it is today, um, where did they go? 
to learn about how to teach people to be doctors. They went to Germany. Everybody went to Germany. The medicine done in Germany by names that you will know, the Burkhaus, the Robert Cox, uh, just to mention a few of the giants of German medicine, was the best in the world by far. I mean, second place wasn't even up for grabs at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the premier nation. Yet, this nation enthusiastically participated in these mass murders, and as we'll talk about some tonight, these gruesome experiments that took place in the camps. So we have the most sophisticated, scientifically advanced nation of its day tipping into this kind of frenzy of mass killing. When I say it's scientifically mediated, there's no doubt that underlying what was going on was a theory that was racist. The race hygiene views of the Nazis, they're uh, fairly well explained out in the exhibit if you want to review some of that. Um, enthusiastic participants, nobody enrolled in the Nazi party like doctors, like scientists, like nurses. They were there in the biggest numbers. Nobody had to drag them in. They came in because they supported the Nazi vision that the German people had to preserve their racial integrity. And those views were around in the 20 and 20s and 30s, long before Hitler came to power. So again, it's not comfortable to think about the idea that, well, probably only the fringe doctors or the minor scientists got involved. That just is not true. Mainstream German medicine, German science was fully engaged by Nazism and some of its most elite practitioners were some of its most enthusiastic uh, agents of mass murder or ran the camps. When I say the Holocaust was the only scientifically and technologically mediated Holocaust, you think about what took place, you had to involve industry. Some of you know at this museum, there's a railway car out there. You had to have a mass transportation system to do killing on this scale. You had to have the involvement of the chemical industry to carry out gassing because it turned out that people could not psychologically stand shooting everybody, which is how the chemical industry came to get involved. Every camp had a doctor meet the trains and sort out who was biologically worthy to be uh, not killed immediately and who was fit to work. Every camp, if they could afford it, also had an anthropologist. So you have scientifically mediated screening at every one of the concentration camps and murder sites uh, uh, during the war. You have uh, race hygiene, public health officials, uh, the entire uh, might of German um, transportation, engineering, and chemistry put to use in mass murder. Nothing else that I know of looks like this. And if you ask me what's the most distinctive feature, it's that, that it is a biomedically and scientifically linked mass murder. Um, whatever goes on in the Balkans, whatever's gone on in different parts of Africa, when we've seen uh, mass murders with the uh, Armenians and on and on, it's not like this. So in that sense, it's hard for medicine of today to look at the most sophisticated forerunner of its time and say, well, how did that happen? It was hard for the Germans to look at it after the war, and it's been hard ever since. And I can tell you, frankly, a new field like medical ethics or bioethics getting going in the 70s the way that you endear yourself to the people you're trying to get to accept you isn't to start off by talking about Nazis. So you don't start there. You just sort of begin after that. Um, there's nothing like getting people's backs up to say, well, you know, uh, got to talk about this because the Nazis did this and what about you? Um, so that is not uh, the greatest marketing strategy ever devised and people did not do it. I wasn't in the first wave of the founders of bioethics, but I was close enough in the second wave to know what was going on and watch it, and uh, that was a problem. But here's the biggest problem, which we'll get to in a, later on tonight. It's become popular, and many people have written about this, to dismiss and handle the challenges of the premier state of its time engaged enthusiastically in mass murder with the full involvement and indeed 
theoretical underpinnings supplied by medicine and science to say, well, still, after all, it must have been a kind of aberrant or weird interlude that led this to happen. The real poster person for Nazi medicine or a Nazi doctor, I should ask you, who is it? Who stands out? Who's the guy that everybody thinks? Mengele. And we'll see Mengele on a slide here in a minute. And Mengele became a convenient whipping boy. If you could get Nazi medicine and its involvement into Mengele, if you could convince everybody that it was the Mengele's who were involved with the camps and the screening and the killing and the transport and the experiments, then it became a little bit more acceptable to sort of go back to normality in Germany after the war. And it became a little more acceptable to say, well, we don't have to really pay attention to these events because they're under the sponsorship or direction of kooks and nuts and crazy people. So marginalizing the doctors became a very important part of the story to separate this idea that the premier biomedical entity had been involved. So Mengele looms very large because he's convenient, but he blocks something. Not only don't you see the involvement of mainstream medicine and science, you don't listen to their ethical arguments for what they're doing. And that's the hardest thing to look at. And that's the reason I said probably no one else will drag you around emotionally in this lecture series the way you'll get dragged a little bit by me tonight because we're going to look at Nazi ethics. And some people might say, but that's an oxymoron. There can't be Nazi ethics. Oh, yes, there was. Despite the fact that some people have written, Chris Browning, Robert J. Lifton before him, about how could it be that people could psychologically reconcile being a doctor and killing? And how could people go to the camp and then go home at night and play with their kids? And they've come up with theories about split personalities and doubling one's personality and other theoretical constructs. And I don't doubt that some of those psychological mechanisms were in play, but psychologizing the doctors and marginalizing the doctors blocks the fact that most of the people who were involved did so because they thought it was the right thing to do. And that's what's hard. And that's what bioethics finds hard. Because if it's the right thing to do, or you can talk yourself into thinking that it's the right thing to do to decompress people or freeze them to death or transplant their eyeballs, then what good is medical ethics? So if there is medical ethics at play, behind all these events, then why are we bothering with it? Because you can convince, you can rationalize anything, to put it bluntly. And that's the weirdest or hardest part for bioethics and medical ethics. It's why I think it's been a long time to get this lecture series. Remember, we're sitting here having a lecture series, uh, one could argue, 60 years late. Um, and even when I did that book, you could argue that was about uh, 50 years late. So why? Well, it's because there's a threat that's deep. And the threat is, why are we talking about ethics at all in business, medicine, or science, if even the Nazis have ethics? And so how are we going to answer or tell anybody to study it or care about it? Is it all just a matter of rationalizing what you do? And that's the dark part. There's some happy news and light at the end of this tunnel, but you'll have to stay awake for the rest of the talk to see what the happy news is at the end. All right, so let's try a slide. We got one up behind me. So here, um, this is my case about why medical ethics or bioethics never really began with uh, the Holocaust. There wasn't any bioethics or medical ethics, no centers, no real courses, no real formal programs until the late 1970s. So the notion that bioethics is born out of the ashes of the Holocaust doesn't make any sense. But even when the programs begin to form, and here I'm talking about the Hastings Center and the University of Texas Medical Branch Program in Medical Humanities and the Penn State Hershey Bioethics Program, the one I started at Columbia, these programs did not have in their readings or books anything about the Holocaust, except one document, which I'll mention in a minute. But there's, there's no uh, uh, reference in any of these things. Can you go back one slide? There's no reference in any of the anthologies of the field to anything about the Holocaust. 
relatively few books and articles. There's no conferences, that's what I was saying. There aren't even people who run around saying, yes, I'm an expert <laughs> in Nazi medicine or what took place in that era. There are more today, although still not many, but I think all of them are showing up in this lecture series actually, but, um, but uh, certainly nothing throughout the 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s, not much going on. So if we pull down an anthology of bioethics readings or medical ethics readings, it starts with the Nuremberg Code. That's always the first reading. And that's a pretty short document, by the way, it's only a page. And the Nuremberg Code was basically the verdict at the trial of the doctors at the end of the war. And we'll say some more about what the content was of that later. But that's what's there. And it sort of comes as if it was out of nowhere. You begin with the Nuremberg Code. Then you usually get a little bit of discussion of some weird CIA experiments involving LSD. Somebody says something about uh, Henry Beecher, who uh, exposed a number of immoral experiments in the United States, including one of my favorites, the placebo-controlled Brownsville, Texas contraception trial, which showed no placebo effect. Um, <laughs> and uh, later Tuskegee. But this Nuremberg Code just sits there and it's hard to know where to come from, what's it doing there. It articulates a series of moral norms, but it's just there. There's nothing before that and the field sort of begins with that document. So that's, I think, sufficient evidence for me to say, look, the case that somehow bioethics started when we all learned how bad Nazi medicine was or the wrong things that uh, German scientists did or all about race hygiene or killing people in the name of uh, burden to the state of the disabled or the psychiatrically impaired because they cost too much. None of that's in these books. It's still not in the books even today. So not only don't we have it, we have something else going on weird today in bioethics, which is the analogies and metaphors to Nazi behavior are frequent, common, and they permeate uh, discussions. Depending on who's riled up about things, you can hear Rush Limbaugh invoke the Nazis. You can hear uh, animal rights activists talk about the Holocaust that befalls animals uh, when they're used in experiments. There's not a few people who find themselves a little bit offended when they see mice and rats analogized to concentration camp victims, but it's out there on many a, a brochure. During the whole uh, Terry Schiavo debate, which I was uh, involved in a lot, uh, I think I represented the, uh, I think I was the only person for a while representing the uh, husband in that case, relative to about 40,000 TV people who uh, thought the parents should be allowed to keep her alive. But in that debate, I, I, it was, there were frequent references to Nazi murder, Nazi euthanasia. If you let Terry die, you're going down the road that the Nazis did. So those analogies are around. You can hear them in the embryonic stem cell debate. Jack Kevorkian elicited a lot of talk about Nazi euthanasia behavior. Um, so it's around all the time. We've got, uh, I threw up a few uh, quotes here for you. Um, this is from the uh, Shivo debate. The philosophy of Nazi doctors lives in the minds of federal judges. That's, that's tough. Um, as well as uh, Michael Schiavo and his new age attorney, George Philos. So this was the kind of rhetoric I'm talking about from the Schiavo case that kept hinting that uh, letting her die was doing what the Nazis had done. Um, one of my favorite radio talk show guys, anybody listen to Michael Savage? Yeah. He's a sort of uh, lunatic that's on. Uh, but here, he, you can read these for yourself. He's just uh, babbling on about Mengeleism uh, relative to Shivo. I got another one here from another one of my favorites. This is uh, good old Patrick Buchanan, uh, who never finds a way to reference the Holocaust without talking about some Catholic priest who got killed there. Um, but he too is, uh, the, uh, these are excerpts that get you to uh, Nazi Germany uh, very, very quickly uh, in analogizing about the Terry Schiavo case. Um, and if you didn't have time to read them, just trust me, they're every place. Um, so the Nazi analogy is invoked a lot. 
we use it, and it's kind of the nuclear bomb of arguments in bioethics or medical ethics. You call somebody, say what you're doing is gonna be a slippery slope to the Nazis, or you are a Nazi, you kind of have ended the debate because there's no real response. That's the worst thing that could happen. Of course, the question then becomes, so what are the appropriate use of the Nazi metaphor and analogy? When is it inappropriate? When is it wrong to cite? Remember what I told you earlier. If you don't know what the Nazis thought and said, then you can call anything that you don't like an example of Nazi behavior. And when we get to things like feminazi, we're probably doing that. Um, and even though I'm laughing about it, I have a feeling that uh, this experience is so brutal and so awful that you have to demand more of the people who invoke it and you should call them out when they do so incorrectly. And I'm gonna tell you that they do so most of the time incorrectly. Well, I mentioned one factor about the Nazi analogy, and that's uh, that eugenics was a big driver behind what the Nazis were up to. And what I mean by that is they believed, Nazi scientists and doctors, that genetic deterioration was a real threat to the public health of the German people. And those theories began to be prominent in the 20s and 30s. As people also began to worry about the genetic health of the German people, they worried about something we are starting to worry about in this country, which is immigration. But the way they worried about it was inbreeding, breeding with foreigners and losing the integrity of uh, the German uh, nation was a threat to the public health of the nation. To put it another way, in the 20s and 30s, <coughs> Nazi eugenicists saw and this is again before Hitler, but in the academic world and in their social science and genetics writings, they saw the health of the German people as a public health problem threatened by bad genes proliferating. And that's where you get the psychiatric problems and the alcoholics and the feeble-minded and the foreigners and the racial degenerates like the uh, blacks or the Jews or the gypsies or the Slavs. It wasn't clear what they thought about um, Asians, they were clearly not fond of Arabs, but made alliances of convenience, but Semites weren't their thing either. So they worried a lot about preserving the public health. Why am I going on and on about this? Let me just give you one analogy. In the Terry Schiavo case, whatever you think about it, nobody proposed allowing Terry Schiavo to die because of her ethnic background. To make an analogy to Terry Schiavo, you'd have to say, because she poses a threat to reproduce or spread her degenerate genes into the population, we ought not allow her to live. That would be an appropriate Nazi analogy. That's how they thought about why you would eliminate certain people or groups. You might also have thought, we shouldn't allow Terry Schiavo to live because we also have a view that not only do these racial inferiors and genetically uh, diseased entities threaten our genetic health, they cost us a lot of money. The German Nazi philosophy was very much committed to the notion of the Volk, the people. It was not individualistic, it was group, and it used public health metaphors all the time. So when the Nazis were concerned about economics, they wondered, What's it gonna to do to the state to have to support a lot of genetic, enfeebled, inferior, costly people? Did anybody suggest that Terry Schiavo ought to be allowed to die because she would burden the cost of the state of Florida or the state of the United States? I don't think so. There were certainly some discussions. People wondered, well, what's it cost to keep her there? But the driving force behind allowing Terry Schiavo to die or not die had nothing to do with her race, nothing to do with her genetic proclivity to spread genes around, and nothing to do with the overall burden that taking care of her would cost the state of Florida or the United States of America or the American people. What was the one thing that people cared about? What was the key to that case? Her... her her choice, right? What did Terry Schiavo want? It's what we call today 
respect for autonomy. Did Terry Shiva want to be in a vegetative state? She couldn't tell us, so we got her in a big fight about who knew best. Her husband, her parents, a judge, Tom DeLay, <laughs> Bill Frist, George Bush. There was a long list of surrogate candidates who might have known best what she wanted. At the end of the day, my view was, unless you could disqualify the husband, he would know best. And the parents tried very hard to do that, and that's what the fight was. I don't think they convinced judges, and so at the end of the day, the husband got to make the call, not any of the other people on the list. What is different in that case is that if you're going to do mass murder in Germany on racial grounds or cost grounds, you don't care what the person thinks. They have to be eliminated because they're a threat to the group. You certainly don't wonder about their autonomy or who would make decisions for them if they can't speak. Indeed, most of the psychiatric murders took place in secret. Nobody was asked. They could have found parents or relatives and said, do you think that they are too costly to the German people? They didn't. They just killed them. There's no analogy, no merit to making the Terry Schiavo case about withdrawing feeding tubes have anything to do with what the Nazis did. And indeed, it diminishes what in fact was morally repugnant about the German position. At that time, if you were a threat to the racial integrity of the country, you were sterilized or killed. If you burdened the state, then you were involuntarily killed. Whatever else goes on with Terry Schiavo, you don't spend 12 years in court before you take a feeding tube away trying to figure out what you would want. It took about two minutes for German courts to decide that economic burdens to the state would be involuntarily killed. When those commentators toss that analogy around, not only is it inappropriate, it blocks what is morally heinous about German medicine of the time. It's racist. That's what's at the core, followed by it's economically sensitive to what it means for the group to have certain people around. I'm not going to tell you that we don't have racists, and I'm not going to tell you that we don't have people who might make economic arguments. But they didn't do it in the Terry Schiavo case. They don't do it in animal experimentation. It has nothing to do with that. They don't do it when it comes to questions about should we sacrifice embryos in embryonic stem cell research. In fact, most of the analogies are vapid. And they are disrespectful to the people who suffered the consequences of the German philosophy, and worse, they don't even allow us to see what was morally wrong about the German philosophy. So you've got basically the first part of my talk, just to recap to here. Hard to look at, don't want to look at it. Ignored, probably because it's difficult to try and peer in to see what the Germans were thinking. Having ignored it, we proliferate the metaphors and analogies to it in all our public policy debates. It's all over the place. Nine times out of 10, it's completely off the mark relative to what the Nazis are doing when you hear some radio commentator or TV pundit or somebody toss up in a debate, whether it's abortion or anything else, the Nazi analogy. Abortion, a million point seven fetuses killed may be a Holocaust of a sort, but the Germans hated abortion. If it was for Aryans, they were as anti-abortion, as pro-life as any group that's ever been on Earth. They wanted compulsory sterilization, compulsory infanticide, and compulsory homicide based on race. Whatever's going on in America about abortion, it's not a discussion that's rooted in race. The discussion's rooted in choice. Completely different. It has no bearing on current events. These analogies are way out of bounds, and no one calls them out in part because we don't know enough to know what to say about them when they appear, other than there's a lot of people dead there, there's a lot of people dead there, I guess that must make them the same. That isn't enough to make them the same. Well, let's go back now and jump into the next thing. Well, so why is it that it's hard to uh, confront 
the Nazis on their own terms, doctors and scientists, about what they did? Well, partly it's because we sometimes say, look, um, we have all kinds of uh, history of anti-Semitism in Germany. Uh, that must have led to it. As I said, we tend to look to kooks and crackpots like Mengele as representative of German medicine. And as I said, there's been a tendency to psychologize away a confrontation with the ethics of what the German doctors and scientists did. There's our friend Mengele. Um, it's tough for medical science in America or Britain to come to grips with the idea that the most advanced and sophisticated medical country of its day got involved in this racist mass murder. It's hard to uh, accept the fact that uh, Nazis came up with ethical arguments. I will now tell you, if you look at the transcripts at Nuremberg, how many doctors and scientists put on trial, stood up and said, you know, we were wrong. Well, actually, None. None. Everybody made an ethical argument. That's hard to look at if you're trying to do bioethics and convince people to pay attention to ethics and take it seriously if the largest scientifically mediated, medically mediated mass murder in history is carried out in the name of ethics. And it's tough to even ask, well, what's the point of all this if you could come up with ethical reasons? So it's, it's, it's very hard and it's a lot easier to marginalize the people who must have been involved. But in fact, there were 26 different kinds of experiments. I'm just gonna look at the uh, medical experiments in the camps here. I'm not gonna get into the euthanasia program and other things uh, which we could look at, but just to focus a bit so we can keep the material under control. Let's look at what took place in the camps and what was done there. Probably the most awful things uh, that were done were causing people tremendous suffering and misery before they died, uh, torturing them in uh, many horrid ways. I'm not even sure I can bring myself to tell you all the experiments, but just some of them involve decompression of people. Some of them involve freezing people to death. Some of them involve giving people wounds and then seeing what medicines work best. Some involve giving people typhoid and typhus to look for treatments. Um, there is a long, and some actually involved trying to do studies of sterilization to figure out how to get it done more effectively. So there's a lot of uh, research that's going on uh, to try and understand uh, what's taking place. This uh, is a chart that shows responsibilities for camp research. And you can see they go right up to Karl Brandt and Hitler. But what I wanted you to see here is, on this chart are some of the best doctors and scientists of Germany not Mengele. This organization looks like HHS charts. It's a very uh, elite group of doctors. And this is the doctors who were put on trial at the end of the war. The doctor's trial actually came first, and it's interesting why they were put on trial first. This is a little side note. Uh, it'll help set the stage for other speakers to come. The doctors went on trial first because the prosecution was at a loss in prosecuting at the end of the war, they had a the problem. If you prosecuted Himmler, or you prosecuted major figures of the German government, exactly who did they kill? How did you get a case against them? They didn't kill anybody. They may have given orders or led killing machines, but they didn't necessarily do anything themselves. They had another problem. This is at a time where there is no genocide convention. There's no rules against mass murder. You have nothing to invoke by international documents. When George Annis comes, he'll tell you that the start of those things is from the Nuremberg trial, and that I would agree with. The prosecutors had a real problem. They had to put people at the scene of a crime and show that somebody caused somebody else's death, and they couldn't rely on crimes against humanity, genocide, to make the case. They stuck these doctors on first because they knew that the judges would be horrified to find out that people had taken the Hippocratic Oath, had killed, and they could put them at the scene of deaths. Some guy would come in at the trial and say, yes, I was in the area where the freezing experiment took place and three men died and he was there. Or I survived the thing. And that's what happened. So these guys went up 
first psychologically to sort of get people angry about what was going on, the judges, and because they could make links to particular doctors to particular deaths. They had witnesses, people came forward who survived the camps and said he was there, this is what happened, this nurse did this, this guy did this. Again, in the exhibit, there's some tapes that show some of this going on at the trial, people showing their wounds and pointing toward a particular doctor from that chart. These are uh, two people I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to say much today about Carl Brandt, but I want you to know something about Gerhard Rose. Gerhard Rose uh, ran those typhus and typhoid experiments in the camps. Gerhard Rose was the head, the chief of the Koch Institute of Tropical Medicine in Berlin. Gerhard Rose was the best infectious disease guy in the world of his day. That's the face of medicine in the camps, not Dr. Mengele. Gerhard Rose is also an interesting figure, as we'll see in a minute, because he felt a lot of ethical anguish about carrying out the experiments that he was asked to do, and initially he wouldn't do them. Only later did he decide to go along. So when they wanted, well, I'll tell you the story now. The Wehrmacht came to him and said, we are losing five men for every one on the Eastern Front that the Red Army is killing in the Wehrmacht, in the German Army. Typhoid and typhus are devastating us. If you don't help find a cure, they are gonna overrun us. We're gonna lose this battle on the Eastern Front and they're gonna come and wipe out Germany. It's your duty to do something about this and we gotta find a cure and find a cure fast. Now we got these people in camps you can infect all, of them, all that you need to and try every pill and vaccine you can think of, but come up with a cure. And Rose said no. He said, it's unethical, I won't do it. And nothing happened to Rose. Rose was so powerful that no one dared to do anything to him. Even the SS didn't do anything to Gerhard Rose. They came back a few months later and said, we're up to about eight men a day now on typhus and typhoid. It's really going bad. It is your patriotic duty to participate in this research. Remember, the people in the camps are all dying anyway. We're going to kill them all. And then Rose did participate. Rose is one of the people put on trial at the doctor's trial. And we'll come back to him in a minute. These are your judges at the Nuremberg trial. This is trying to make a point to you about something uh, it's also hard to look at, but important to keep in mind. If you want to figure out when was a Dr. Mengele doing an experiment, and when were top flight people like Gerhard Rose doing an experiment, there's one marker that I can tell you, having studied this for many years, that gives it away. Military sponsorship. If it's funded by the military or the Luftwaffe, it's real science, and real scientists are brought in. If it's funded by nobody, and you have your own pet theory about eye color or something else, Mengele style, then you're allowed to do what you want, but nobody takes it very seriously. Nobody presents it at medical meetings. Nobody puts it in the German medical publications. Mengele was fringe, but it's because nobody actually cared what he was up to. This is pilots bailing out at high altitude. And some of you know the Germans were moving pretty fast toward jets. And they knew that they had a problem with decompression. And they had to figure out what to do to keep those pilots alive because they were getting short on pilots. The Luftwaffe sponsored the decompression studies, which was brutal as they come, making the decompression units and literally blowing people to bits inside them. But the people who did them, Romberg and Ruff from the University of Kiel, were first-rate physiologists. And the data was published in German medical journals many of which, by the way, were on subscription here. So that data came over here. Military sponsorship, decompression, freezing, hypothermia, wounds, can you desalinate water? Those are all done by the military. Every one of them involves as good a scientist or doctor as Germany's got. And typhus obviously is including people like Carl Brandt, I mean, uh, Gerhard Rose, excuse me, Gerhard Rose. So these are the ones that you know are not Mengele land. And this is where you can see that the mainstream is there with scientists that we would find today at MD Anderson, the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard doing the work in the camps. That's what I'm talking about, mainstream. 
these are, this is the setup for the hypothermia experiment. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit. Somebody, people sometimes ask me, is any of the data from these uh, experiments used? And this one shows you exactly how all of you have been touched by this type of uh, research done by very legitimate scientists. You can see that man is in a vat of frozen water and you can see that his head is out. Before 1940, all life preservers were belts. You would tie the belt, that's what they had on the Titanic, and they were all belt float things. Sometimes they had something that went up to your diaphragm, up to the middle of your chest, but you tied them around your waist. The German hypothermia research established that the way to keep somebody alive the longest was to keep their head out of water, and that's what that guy's doing in that frozen tank. And that's the design of the life vest that you wear. And it all came out of those experiments around your head, with your head out. Keep the cerebellum out of the water. That's the road to staying alive the longest. The British military used it. The Japanese did. The Soviets, the then Soviets did. We did. Everybody took that work. Life vest redesign took place. So if you want to know, have you been touched literally by the camps? Yes, you have if you've ever put on a life preserver or had one under the seat in an airline or on a boat. That's the design shift. Those are those uh, decompression experiments I talked about driven down from the University of Kiel. That's the inside. This is uh, one of the uh, experimenters. You can get the idea of what's going on here. This is a pilot setup. This isn't just some eyeball transplant. They're trying to mimic conditions in high altitude to see what can be done to keep the guy from recovering. So what he's wearing is what a, you can recognize even today is what jet pilots wear at high altitude when they decompress. Same thing. One other little, inter uh, go back one please, one more. One other interesting interlude, this man died in this experiment. There's one other sign that research is being taken very seriously in the camps, that it's not mengling. Not only is it sponsored by the military, but you pick your subjects very carefully. This guy's a political prisoner. He's not a Jew. He's not a gypsy. He's probably either a political prisoner, a religious objector, maybe a Jehovah's Witness, or he could be a Dutch doctor. Why? Because if you're going to do research that counts, you have to do it on Aryan people. So all subject selection is very carefully done in the core part of research experimentation to get the right kind of subjects so that you can extend the data appropriately to German pilots, German soldiers, whatever you're trying to uh, benefit the German people from. Wound research, skin grafting for burns, same idea, military took an interest, same. Um, this is uh, an experiment that they took very, very seriously. They were trying to figure out how to get potable water from seawater. Again, you have to understand 1943, 44, they are really getting beaten up in terms of losing competent pilots and competent uh, sea captains stranded up in uh, Norway or battles in the North Sea. They've really got a problem of trying to save these guys' lives and they're desperate to find some way. They're desperate to make rubber, which they're out of. They're desperate to find oil supplies, which they're getting cut off from, and they're desperate to find ways to get people water to drink if they're stranded. So these experiments were very extensive and done by two excellent physiologists. Burns. I'm going to run through these some more. All right, so sometimes people say, well, you know, that German science, what they know, it's Dr. Mengele. It couldn't be very good. There's plenty of good science done by the standards of the day in the camps, done by very good scientists. Sometimes people wonder, should we use Nazi data? Well, I can tell you it's all been used. Um, it's used in the life vest design, but uh, the information, the negative information that came out of the typhus and typhoid trials was used. Uh, the toxicity of phosgene gas, which was used in the mass killings. When we have the EPA do an analysis today, of what's dangerous at phosgene gas level exposures. It's from the Nazi data. Um, it isn't even interesting to argue about whether you should use it. It's more interesting to argue about how should you cite it. Because it is used and has been used by many countries in many places. 
that researchers are not inept. You can't get rid of the, what took place that way. Um, and as I said, if you want a criteria watch for is it military or non-military and its sponsorship. So now we get to the heart of the talk tonight. And this is the part that I think is the toughest. When these guys are on trial, they, as I told you, did not stand up and say, this, we were nuts or this was a weird interlude or I don't know what happened or we were all crazy or they ordered everybody to do all this. I know it's become popular to psychologize and say, well, they just must have suppressed it or repressed it or had a split personality. And I'm, again, I'm sympathetic to Lifted and others who've taken that tack to try to understand how you live with yourself if you're blowing people's brains up in a de decompression chamber as your day job. But this is the arguments that you can find in the transcripts. And I've teased them out and just summarized them here. The key argument made by many was they took subjects who were doomed to die. If someone is going to die anyway, you might as well learn something from them. And that was a common argument that many of the uh, researchers brought forward. There was nothing we could do. These people are going to die. We might as well learn, put them in experiments, get some benefit from them. There was even a hint that maybe their deaths wouldn't be in vain. They're prisoners. Now, today in America, it's very common to hear people say we should do research on prisoners. They're prisoners. It's not an argument that's unknown to us. There are many people who would say, uh, do what you want if you're a prisoner. So criminals and prisoners were used. Up there I have this uh, little heading. You can see it says Ivy Dilemma. That was Andrew Ivy. I'll tell you this story too, just because it's interesting in terms of American history. Andrew Ivy was a leading American researcher at the University of Chicago, and he was brought to the trial by the Americans to testify that Americans would not do research on prisoners. And the German defense team had a blast with Andrew Ivey. What they did was they went back through his research record and found out that in the 1930s at the Statesville prison in Illinois, he had conducted numerous experiments on prisoners with no consent. And they got him up on the stand and counter cross-examined him and basically destroyed his testimony. So even in the United States, this notion that we wouldn't do whatever we want to prisoners, if you think about it, we have been doing research on prisoners until the 1980s with abandon. Take advantage of tragedy. This is a very interesting argument. Claude Bernard made it actually, the famous French uh, experimentalist from the 19th century, who is one of the pioneers of the scientific method and medical ethics and doesn't get the attention he deserves in my view. But one thing, Claude Bernard argued vociferously in his book, Introduction to Experimental Medicine, which all the medical students here, given all your free time, should drag out and just browse a little bit. It's pretty interesting, short. Um, what Claude Bernard said is this. You shouldn't create tragedies and you shouldn't create disasters, but if one happens, you should get there and learn what's going on. If there's a civil war in the United States and people's legs are being blown off, or if there's Iraq and people are getting concussive head injury, then you study them and try to learn from that fact you've got a new population that's there that you can learn from. If a plague breaks out, you learn from it. If an earthquake takes place and people suffer crush injuries or panic or whatever, you learn from it. So his notion was experiments in nature have to be taken advantage of. Shouldn't cause them, but you should learn from them. Most of the Nazi doctors said, that's what we did in the camps. We didn't set them up, although they partly did, but they're there and so we're gonna learn from what's taking place. So that became a very strong ethical argument. Here's one that might echo. Under conditions of war, there are no rules about what you do in experiments. Anybody heard that? So they made it too. And this is probably the most powerful one of all, and it's the Gerhard Rose argument. If you can benefit many, many people by the sacrifice of the few, you must do it. If you could save thousands of lives by sacrificing a few, this is Jack talking from 24, 
Um, we'd allow some torture to get the answer to where they put that nuclear bomb. That's Gerhard Rose. Now, Gerhard Rose said, I basically experimented on 200 people in the camps. If I had found the cure for typhus, which he didn't, but if I'd found something that would have benefited hundreds of thousands of people and maybe millions worldwide, would that not be worth it? Now, let me tell you, friends, that's an ethical argument with a lot of clout. And the prosecution team didn't know what to do with it. They had no idea how to respond to it. It's straight utilitarian in ethics talk, but it's powerful. We use it ourselves. It comes up all the time in our debates about war. It comes up about Abu Ghraib. It comes out about torture. It comes out of national security. It's all over the place. It hasn't gone away. It's right around. That was their package, basically, of what they had to say about what they did was right. You don't find it presented very often. It usually gets lost with Mengele or lost as fringe doctors. But when the mainstream had to account for what they were doing, and I think this tells you, by the way, why they went to work, more than personality splits or other things. They went to work because they believed that it was right to do it. And I'll go further and say, I rarely, in all my years of doing bioethics and medical ethics, find people who say, you know, I'm going to wake up today, and I know it's wrong to do this thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Most people think, whether they're going to cheat or steal an authorship or lie in a grant, that it's worth it for some reason that they will justify ethically in their head. They don't usually say, yeah, yeah, it's horrible, but I'll, I don't know, I'll do it. We actually call those people sociopaths. <laughs> um, so the German elite in the camps in the worst experiments with the most deaths and the most suffering of all had ethical arguments. Now, before I go to the next slide, that lets me ask a question to you all. I told you that the Nuremberg Code appears in all bioethics book as the first document. Anybody know what the first principle is of the Nuremberg Code? And by the way, it's the first principle of the Helsinki Code of Ethics and the AMA Code of Ethics today. Informed consent. It actually says, in doing research, the informed consent of the subject is absolutely essential. Now, if you just read that, it sounds all right, I guess. In American ears, it sounds particularly all right, because we like individualism anyway. What's it doing there? It's the answer to this. You can't just do benefit. You must have consent, even if you could save many people, disproportionately many people. You may not do experimentation unless you have the permission of the subject. So the judges didn't know what to do to respond to it, but they, in a sense, articulated an ethical code, and that's why it's the first principle. That's why it stayed the first principle in all the international documents ever since, because the utilitarian argument has a lot of force. So it's basically saying the dignity of the individual is going to take precedence over the benefit to the group. Now, sometimes we deviate from that. We make up circumstances where we might bend that rule. I would urge you to think about the price that gets paid if you open that door up. You open the door up to what was going on in the camps. And, interestingly enough, it's why Gerhard Rose wasn't hung. Because after he made his defense and after he told the story that I just told you, he got a 15-year sentence and was let out. Many of the rest of the doctors were put to death, but people understood what Gerhard Rose said. The judges got it, everybody got it, and they didn't ultimately. He wasn't a racist. He was a guy who was trying to think about the right thing to do and sort of went with the good to the common good. The, uh, that's, that's poor Andrew Ivey, who will pass him by for now. This is Rose at the trial. I, I, I'm fascinated by Rose because he agonized so hard about what was the right thing to do, tried to do the right thing as he saw it, didn't go along at first, and then only later yielded to the numbers, if you will. That's him do. One more. So the ethical arguments that the Nazis have, not only are they there, they're very powerful. They're still raised in different debates today. 
that's more interesting to me than the silly analogies that we get out of uh, the radio shows and the punsters, so to speak. They're discomforting because they have enough ethical power that you could see yourself saying what they said. People are going to die anyway. Why not benefit? Under conditions of total all-out war with the nation's fate hanging in the balance, we're going to follow ethics rules about experiments. Do we actually care that much about the rights of prisoners? Murderers? Threats to the health of us all? Terrorists? If you could really save a lot of us by sacrificing just a few people with HIV or somebody who's unpopular because they're a homosexual, why don't we do that? If you could really come up with a cure. So these arguments are not lacking in oomph. They got uh, power. They offend some people in bioethics because it's hard to talk about Nazi ethics, but what I wanted you to understand tonight is there is Nazi ethics. You just looked at it. <laughs> it's not so different from some of our ethics, and you have to sort of come back and take it on. So the notion that bioethics is born out of the camps, I don't think so. It comes out of Tuskegee uh, later, much later. The Holocaust was put on the side, and nobody wanted to look at it because it was too hard to look at these. The fact that the Germans not only had ethics arguments, they had good ethics arguments. Powerful ethics arguments. So the response that we've come back with today to give you the light at the end of the tunnel is this. We won't allow utilitarianism to dominate the ethic of human experimentation. We will insist on informed consent. One of the weird things about the Nuremberg Code, I told you what that first principle was, the consent of the subject is absolutely essential, had to be changed right away. Why? Couldn't do research on children and do research on psychiatrically impaired people. So you had to add in, in the Helsinki Code, and subsequently, you add in the consent of the subject or their surrogate, because it was too restrictive. It, it cut off certain kinds of research that people agreed should proceed. But we have now grounded all human experimentation in the United States on the idea that subject consent is essential. That's why we spend so much ridiculous time with the informed consent forms. It's why we keep using them, even though half the time people are thinking they don't understand them. I could get them to agree to anything I want. But the aspiration to make it happen goes right back to here. And if you don't look at the history and what the German argument was, you have no idea why we're spending so much time with these stupid forms. Because every time you go to a subject, you're asking them to make a gift that they don't have to do, even if it would benefit a lot of people. There's no duty. There's no obligation. Even the power of numbers, you'd benefit and help a whole lot of people. It's up to you to choose. So it's a pretty powerful framework. Even the symbolicness of it may overwhelm the reality of whether people actually give informed consent. We put prisoners pretty much off limits. You want to know why? It's not because we're in love with them. It's because of the abuses. That's why. It's hard to do research on prisoners. We basically said, in conditions of war, we should still adhere to our ethics until recently. So that was always a principle that we tried to follow uh, in doing research. We had some deviations. You'll recall the radiation experiments done by the military, nuclear explosions. We had a whole commission come in and say, even in the military, you should be getting consent. You want to try a new vaccine? get this consent of the soldiers. We deviate off and on from that. It's up to all of us whether we think the conditions of war should void the rules. I happen to think they shouldn't, but that's where that debate goes. Even the terminally ill cannot be put to use for any purpose that anybody wants in research. You still try to chase down consent even for the dying. It's because of the German argument that if you're dying, you're a free fire zone, you can do whatever you want. So the notion that the dying don't lose their rights just because they're dying was the response to the German argument there. And that's written into all our codes and practices. We may tend to go to the terminal ill because we think we can do less harm if they're going to die anyway by having a bad side effect or a bad outcome. But we're still supposed to try and get permission. In the Brooklyn Chronic Disease Hospital Experiments, where living cancer cells were injected into demented nursing home patients that Henry Beecher exposed in 1967 
he brought this code out and said, we're breaking our own rules here. You're not consenting these subjects. You're using them like guinea pigs, like animals. That's not the way to do research. Beecher was one of the few people that had read the Nuremberg Code to know what the principles were that were articulated there. So if you will, what we did was we set out in ethics terms a deontological set of rules, a, a set of principles about research that are supposed to be boundaries. You can't cross. Consent, prisoners off limits except for minimally risky things. The terminal you'll still get to choose to participate or not. We're not going to avoid these rules off in conditions of total war. And those basically became the framework that guides what goes on today in research. Now, there are plenty of problems today. I've hinted that informed consent may not work very well. I happen to think it rarely works. Most people, when they're sick, will agree to whatever the doctor offers. Most people don't read their consent forms. Most people, in fact, uh, find it frustrating that they're even asked to give their informed consent. They basically want the doctor to try and make the decision for them and not burden them. I understand why people do that. The history tells you why you want to still try and work hard to make them participate and choose to be in research. That's what the history lesson is. It's hard to do. I'm not going to tell you it's not hard to do. I've done my share of informed consent solicitations, and uh, they can be pretty <clears throat> optimistic at times. We added in one more protection in American research that spread worldwide, and that's review by committee. And I'm going to end on this note. Tuskegee took place in the United States. If you think bioethics was born in the Holocaust, Tuskegee is 30 years after. It's sponsored by the US Public Health Service. Tuskegee has one thing in common with the Holocaust. It was racist. And if you want to find an analogy that works, the reason they picked poor black men in the South to study the course of syphilis in and then lied to them, even though there was a treatment, was they didn't give a shit about poor black men in Alabama. It was racist, just like the Nazis. That is an appropriate analogy. They basically took a group of people, put them into research to benefit the rest of us, and said, I don't care about you because you are a poor black male. And that is the one place where the analogy holds. But it certainly doesn't give any evidence to the idea that we all read the Nuremberg Code, understood what took place in those camps and who was there and what they were thinking, because we did the same thing 30 years later. So in that sense, there is a lesson to be learned. It's our bad history. We didn't pay attention to the events of the Holocaust. We thought it was just a bunch of nutty, kooky Mengele's who ran off and did crazy things and had nothing to do with the mainstream of medicine or science, and we could ignore it. And we failed to learn anything. It took the Tuskegee study 30 years later to get our attention to the idea that legitimate science, legitimate public health, if infused with racism, could go off the rails. That was our little experience. But we should have learned more, and I guess tonight I've tried to convince you that if you don't want to slip to some pretty bad places, you have to be ready to stand up for principles that many of the best doctors and scientists in Germany did not. Thank you.